Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Sound Arts Visiting Practitioner Series. I've been informed that we have a hashtag, hashtag LCC Sound Arts. You can follow it on Instagram and Twitter. Um, so that's my first announcement. Um, and my second announcement is that there's an event going on directly after this in the dark room, and I'll have a bit more information at the end to remind you. Everyone is welcome. So I'm really pleased this week to welcome Joanne, who I'm going to introduce, and she's going to present and perform for us today, which is quite exciting. So I'll just read out her bio and then hand it over. Dr. Joanne Armitage is a research associate in, at the University of Cambridge and also teaches at the University of Leeds. Um, sorry, research associate in the Department of Sociology at Cambridge and Media and Communications at Leeds. Joanne's work explores the role of technology in culture and society. She's interested in emerging technolo technology practices, digital methods and feminist technoscience. She's currently working on the Air Kit Proof of Concept project as part of the Citizen Sense Research Group. Joanne's re recent research has looked at the live coding community, a practice where code is written live and projected as part of a performance to examine the relationship between technology and the body by drawing on feminist literature. Her interests in technology and society emerged through public workshops such as machine learning imaginations, where pa participants explore machine learning as embodied, as an embodied living, sorry, <laughs> as an embodied lived and reconfigurable technology. In 2018, she participated in a coding cultural exchange between Yorkshire and Tokyo. Um, and in her work, she brings together many of her research interests through artistic practice as an algorithmic musician. Um, her work has been featured in The Times, Guardian, BBC Radio 3 and BBC Radio 5. She's received Sound of Music's Composer Curator Fund in 2018 and is a resident at Somerset House Studios. So she's very busy and we're very happy to have her today. So welcome, Joanne. I'd normally, normally be teaching my students at Leeds this afternoon sensory media, but I managed to sneak in a, a reading week um, to come and see you, you lot. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Annie. Um, I'm really excited to come here and talk to um, people interested in sound studies. It's something that I actually don't get to talk about very much in my job. Um, my job's plural. Um, at Cambridge, I'm working in the sociology department um, on citizen environmental sensing practices, which is a slightly different uh, flex to my music work. And at Leeds, um, I work on digital media, so we do things like web programming, digital methods, and I snuck in a tiny bit of sound recording last week. People did seem to quite like it, so um, I got away with that. So in this talk, I'll talk to you a little bit about um, my journey. So I'm going to go, this is the furthest back I've ever gone in my history in one of these kinds of talks. We'll see how it goes. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit about my education, what I've studied, um, the sort of strange tensions and choices that come out around that. I'll then talk a bit about who I work with. Um, I work, I'm lucky to work with quite a lot of good people through the years. Um, and through that, hopefully share you a bit of my experience of collaborating, um, the challenges that it, in, that in, it entails, um, after that, um, I'm going to show some of my work. Um, depending on time, I've got like quite a longer video, um, and I want to do a quick demo. And perhaps I'll like start playing something, and I'll show you how it works. And then, if anyone fancies coming and editing the code and having a go, we can kind of close the session like that. Um, oh yeah, no, but actually, we won't quite finish it there because there's a few things I want to. I want to say to kind of draw it together about things that I'm concerned about uh, and notice in my work and, um, you know, might resonate with you in some way, making loads of assumptions there. Um, so I was born in 1990 in Banbury Hospital. Um, 
and I went to school in our local village. Uh, I lived in a village called Great Worth. I'm the oldest of six, and um, I was from like a low mid-income family. When I was in year three at school, so I was about six or seven years old, um, my class, there was maybe around 20 of us. I don't remember many of their names anymore. We sat in the assembly hall, which is that kind of triangle building there. And the teacher went up to a music system, put in a CD and played, some, played a piece of music. And we had to identify whether pitches were higher or lower or the same as each other. So it was kind of like a strange hearing test. Um, and I really loved playing the recorder when I was younger and I was really keen to like do well in a, in a music test. Um, and I was lucky enough to be at, uh, th one of three people who got the highest marks in that listening test, which is like incredibly um, problematic. And I don't think it's how South Northamptonshire organised the... Um, who, who, so it was about who got to play the violin in school and who got loaned three violins by the council um, <laughs> and got pretty terrible violin lessons. Um, but I think it's interesting that, you know, these kinds of quite banal things, I remember it really vividly. And when I was thinking about, you know, my, my journey as, I don't really think of myself strictly as a musician, but as a musician, it kind of originates in this hallway where I sort of got semi-validated for being able to tell if tell better than like 17 other people. Actually, I think one person did better than me. Um, that notes were higher or lower than each other. Um, and obviously the kind of like um, gaps in that method of, of measuring musicality. I don't know how they organise it now. I don't even know if they, do, they seem to do so many music lessons in school anymore. So I was an unwilling violinist for 10 years. I absolutely hated playing the violin. I was terrible at it, but I stuck with it because I passed this test. Um, through my younger years, and, and I always hear these stories of kind of computer musicians and sound artists who, you know, started programming at a really young age and or like, you know, started working with synthesizers. And when I try and root through my memories of like interacting with music in sort of mediated by computers, um, there's three things that pop up. So I don't know if anyone recognises any of these, but on the far um, on the far right here is Cakewalk Express, um, which was a precursor to Sibelius um, and would render some really horrible MIDI sounds. And I'd spend hours editing and just trying to make something good come out of it, but it was always pretty terrible and, and disappointing. Further along, Top of the Pops Mix Factory. Did anybody have this or encounter this at all? Yeah? <laughs> like, it's quite... <laughs> I used to love playing on this. Um, you kind of bring blocks of sounds together and overlay them. It's quite a colourful interface. I can't remember it fully, but I remember spending a lot of time with um, my sisters writing pop songs um, that didn't really work or didn't, couldn't really exist together on this. Um, in the bottom corner, I still have this uh, book. Was a book I stole from my oh this is on this is getting filmed from uh, my secondary school library on keyboards and computer music, and it has a lot of robots telling us about um, MIDI cables. Um, so I was always kind of interested in um, in sound and music, um, and always kind of was working on and thinking about these things, but not really in a knowing way. And when I went to study my undergraduate degree, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to study music, multimedia and electronic engineering at the University of Leeds, which by all accounts was a little bit of a disappointment. Um, they kind of taught quite um, straight up engineering and quite traditional music. And there wasn't really much um, meshing of the two. So I spent three years um, programming robot buggies to go around labs. So I learned how to code, which, which has been, proved to be quite useful. Um, 
and we worked on lots of projects together the and um I ended up getting interested in algorithmic music um but I was always but we never learned things like Max MSP properly or Super Collider which is what I actually really wanted to do um so Super Collider is something that I use quite a lot now and I guess do you do you use Super Collider here a little bit um I know you do <laughs> um and so this is a picture of me with my final project, which was this kind of like terrible uh, conductor's baton. Well, it, can't, it worked that picked up um, the beat points of a, conduct, of a very traditional, stable conducting gesture and um, over a wireless network sent tempo vibrations to people which at the time seemed like a kind of weird thing to do. And, and I wrote some music um, for it to kind of work with um, some different uh, instrumental performers. But actually, you can buy these kinds of things in, as consumer products these days. Um, that's like the Sound Brenner Pulse. I noticed my sister's partner has one on the side. I, was, I need to ask him about it because I don't know if, um, if he's ever used it. But this was quite novel at the time, um, uh, the idea of like kind of vibrating through synchronizing. And we found that actually it worked all right. Um, not much better or worse than um, sound, but obviously this was third year study. So um, I, don't, I don't know if our methodology was the most rigorous. Uh, but through that time, I had a really good mentor called Dr. Kia Ng who was one of the early kind of, um, he worked a lot on sort of projects like music via motion, so sonifying dance, um, using kind of really old computers, lots and lots of really old computers. Um, and around that time, I attended lots of conferences on computer music, and I saw some really interesting and some really terrible work. But one thing that really stuck me with that at that time, so on my course there was 12 of us, and I'm Joanne Armitage, and I studied with my friend Jack Armitage. And I started noticing how differently Jack and Joanne Armitage were treated by different people. Um, and that kind of came to a head at one international compu computer music conference where um, a woman there was referring to me as Thingy but knew Jack's name and made me look after her kids for a week. <laughs> so through my undergraduate degree, I foolishly went straight into doing a PhD, which was technically in music composition, although due to some aforementioned experiences, I really didn't want to be a composer. And I started my PhD, so there, there were a few things that w went wrong with my PhD. I started it way too early because I, didn't, I, would, I couldn't move home and I didn't want to go work at a technology startup. And, and my supervisor said, hey, apply for a PhD. And somehow, I don't know, they seemed to fund anything. They funded me. Um, but I started my PhD at 22, um, which felt a lot way too young and was quite frustrating a, a lot of the time. I ended up as a carer in my first year of my PhD really unexpectedly, which took a big toll on like my physical and mental well-being. Um, the final thing that, well, no, one of the other kind of like more personal life type things that went wrong was that my supervisor, um, Kia Ung, fell ill in my third year and had to take early retirement. So kind of setting up a kind of terrible backdrop. And, and with this, I was working with a not quite yet emergent technology, which was really hard in a music lab uh, with no resources. Um, so it was a really frustrating time. Um, and one of the first works that I developed was this silent metronome. So drawing on this idea of um, sonifying, conducting gesture, I thought, oh no, I've got to do something. How about I'll just wang a tempo to some vibrators and play with my mate, Greta. <laughs> um, and so we, we kind of built something where we could communicate tempo together. Um, so I'm coding in Super Collider there. A similar setup to what I have today. Uh, Greta's playing percussion. And there are some quite nice videos of this that I, I, I'm not sharing today. 
Um, but there's one nice picture, and I've used the wrong one, of, of Greta looking at me really attentively and me sort of just staring at my computer, staring at my computer like this. Um, and it kind of worked. Um, it was fun to play with someone um, a, a, using a different kind of set of sounds, a different, a different way of uh, playing, a percussionist. Um, but I started to think, oh, I should probably try and do something that isn't just like things vibrating in time with each other. Um, and through that point, I, I came across, um, well, Kia, my supervisor, had worked with Evelyn Glennie before. Does everyone know who Evelyn Glennie is? I think I should say Dame Evelyn Glennie, um, a profoundly um, deaf percussionist um, who played in the... 2012 Olympic Games ceremony, she, pretty big deal. Um, but Kira had worked with her before, and I came across this hearing essay that she wrote where she said, hearing is basically a specialised form of touch. So I started to kind of think about ways of um, connecting sound, vibration, and the body. And that kind of thinking opened up lots of sort of interesting questions and opportunities, lots of kind of failed experiments and opportunities. So here on, in this image, you can see this sort of iteration um, of, I guess I called it a listening system um, called Enclosed. And there are a few different variations of it. Um, so I've designed some kind of schematics, uh, built a little circuit. The first version was this sort of four-way grid or pad. Um, the second version was a belt um, that you could wear, and I created a spatial audio piece where the vibrations around your um, tummy um, followed the sounds in your head. And it actually, I mean, it looks hacky. Uh, it was hacky, but it feels really good. Um, and... What was really interesting about it, I've got some interviews from people who listened through it, and they began to hear relationships that actually weren't there in the sound. Um, so they were thinking that the, the frequency was somehow connecting with the, the vibration um, when there was no sort of mapping or relationship there. So I think that, that revealed to me something really interesting about working in sort of wonky practices and creating sort of novel experiences that actually in many ways it's the novelty of, of the feeling of it and it does feel quite different to, you know it feels quite strange um, so the novelty kind of ends up superseding the kind of artistic or creative goal you're aiming for um, another piece I made around this time um, was it's called my back catalogue rendered as vibrations on your body um, so I bought these motors these ones at the bottom and they're really powerful um, so I embedded some in a sort of comfy foam cushion and it just plays quite loudly um, well I don't know strongly in your back um, loads of recordings that I've done and never released I'm really bad at um, I don't really like recording and I don't really like releasing music and it's been a bit of a stumbling block in my musical career um, I imagine some of you feel similarly I really like performing and being in sound and being with sound, but sitting alone at my desk, oh yeah, I'm making sound with other people, but sitting alone at my desk, like really kind of precisely, you know, I think it's this tension between like being, a, being towards being a perfectionist and being able to let go and for things to be finished. So I, I, released my album in this way through these um, vibrations that play on your back. Um, and it was all kind of hacked together and I made it by hand. Um, the straws on the side, I know straws are a bit like, you can't really talk about straws these days, but um, these are some eight millimeter straws that I got from Ikea that were wide enough to f slot in the motors so I didn't have to get anything bespokely made. Um, 
I remember going to Ikea and just buying these straws. I think I still have them at home. They're, they're all right for smoothies, but they do feel quite wasteful. Um, so my main sort of musical outlet is as a live coder. Um, and I found it like an interesting journey, sort of. And it's an interesting way of like working with sound. Um, one, this is a piece that I created for live coding called Key, and it's really simple. Um, as you type, um, it converts the, your key presses into little vibrations that are held by different people in the audience. So you can sort of get a sense of the sort of tactile movement of the performer. Um, and it sort of renders what you'd see in editing code a little bit in this really one dimensional way as vibration. Um, it was kind of like a proof of concept idea. Um, and it was there to think about. And, and the reason why I kind of created the piece was because at the time I was quite, I'd only been live coding for about a year and I'd spend a lot of time really like fervently typing and the sound wouldn't change. Um, so I kind of wanted to highlight the processes that I was going through, that I was working really hard. And, and, and I mapped it so it effect, so um, my flow was kind of, when I was typing more intensely, the vibration was much stronger. And as I sort of slowed down and was struggling and debugging, the vibration became very faint. So trying to like give a sense of sort of my flow and my timeline in the performance, um, which is quite different from um, abstracted from the time of the sound. Um, and from this, I made another piece called It Is Only Midi, which was sort of grew from um, it grew from key. But this was in response to some feedback I'd got from a conference and I'd put in for Greta and I to perform with the metronome. And I said about my live coding setup that I use MIDI synthesizers. And one of the feedback was like, oh, it's only MIDI. And was quite dismissive and was saying about, you know, real live coders code from scratch and they use software synthesizers, which are completely different from hardware synthesizers. Um, and it was just it just revealed to me something about um, how people um, conceive of um, what virtuosity and authenticity is in live coding. If you were really to code from scratch, it would be a terrible performance because I don't think there'd be a lot of sound for a really long time. And whether you've got to do build your operating system. Uh, a lot of live coders use samples anyway, so the idea that MIDI was like inauthentic and only MIDI, I found really just quite hilarious. Um, so the next, so I wrote, the, so I made this piece for the next um, version of the same conference um, and performed with it. Um, and what I found interesting about working with, so it was a grid and it sort of um, rendered the MIDI piano roll, kind of like a piano roll, as vibrations in, in the back of the chair. So the person could like sit back and feel um, the vibrations. Um, it was partly because, so one of the motivations was, and maybe you'll hear some of this later when I play, but the kind of musical data turning notes on and turning notes off um, gets quite abstracted from the sound itself. So when you kind of really aggressively edit parameters. So you could have a sound that's, you know, goes on and then off, but it keeps on playing forever, for example. But it gets kind of more granular and chaotic as, as the sound becomes more complex. So kind of showing the relationship between the notes, values, and um, the qualities of the sound. Uh, another thing I found playing with this was that instead of me me just like performing and then someone else getting to feel a bit of it. I actually started thinking about um, and playing and practicing with the vibrating pad and thinking about actually how could I create a piece that, that feels good on this or feels interesting. Um, 
And this, 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 this is really what my PhD ended up being about, that we end up making all these like weird technologies and performance systems. Um, and they just end up really constraining our practice <laughs> and making us do things differently, which is, you know, it's useful. Um, but actually sometimes the kind of like bigger conceptual issues we're trying to look at with performance systems end up not really coming through. Um, and then just one more piece to add to that. So this was a, a collaborator of mine, Shelley Knotts, moved to Australia. So we built like a vibrating thing so we could feel each other's stress um, when we were performing remotely. So we had kind of galvanic skin response sensors, which as we get stressed, our skin um, lets a bit of sweat out. Um, and the more sweat, the more stressed we are. And these sensors, and, and, and that, that wetness makes our skin more conductive. So as they increase in value, our stress goes up. So we were like mapping the vibrations to that. Oh, I'm using heart rate, but they're a bit dodgy readings. So we used to avoid that. Um, so this was quite like a funny piece to like play together. At, I know a few times I played with it at 4 a.m. on like a week I just moved house, it was awful. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the haptic vibratory part of my work. Um, I've got a little video I can show, but perhaps um, I'll move on um, and I could send Annie some of the links. Um, I can just send my slides through um, in case anyone wants to watch any of the sort of multimedia content. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about collaboration um, because it's really hard. Um, it's really fragile and can be really fraught. Um, what I've really learned recently is, um, you know, I, I think I've learned a lot about collaboration recently and thinking about, you know, who you work with and how that affects your life. Um, and also being clear about your position in collaborations. And I've had occasions when my work has been seen as the product of another group, but I've also been in a position where, you know, a group's work has been seen as the product of me. So kind of managing those tensions and sort of different power relations that unfold. So I'm going to talk about different kinds of collaboration, some of which will be kind of worker employer. Um, there's been some non-hierarchical non and kind of quite idealistic collaborations I've been involved in, artist-led collaborations, um, collaborations that have been really small and quick and convenient. Um, and thinking about, you know, wh why, why we collaborate and like what comes out of that. So the kind of challenges, that it allows you to address in your own work, um, the new angles and perspectives you get, the support that you find, um, but also the th kind of things that we should be um, kind of conscious of. So this is one project called Offal, which Annie, um, I'm kind of very loosely involved in this still, and Annie's kind of loosely I don't know, we're on the website still. So I say till present, but offal has gone a little bit quiet recently. Um, all good things come to an end. And it is really healthy when collaborations end. So Offal, it stands for Orchestra for Females and, lap and at Laptops. Um, and it was sort of uh, coming together of lots of uh, laptop-based um, musicians but also there's a I think there's a cellist and a singer as well um, to collaborate across the world so there there are performers in Canada in um, Colombia Mexico uh, f a while someone in Australia Scotland <laughs> uh, France um, and um, a lot of the system Shelley Knotts would build and um, she studied kind of algorithmic composition and particularly looking at sort of how um, you can embed like and build like sort of democratic and fair structures within um, those kinds of systems. So this, this example here is, is one we built called uh, control, command line, sorry. And this was 
a voting system where different performers or all the performers would send instructions and vote on them. And if they receive 50%, um, the performer would then be expected to like change um, and add. So for example, you could write a short code for someone. So you could say, Joanne, play some noise. Um, Joanne, play high notes, play staccato. So quite broad sort of musical characteristics and then we would vote on it. It was quite glitchy and we did a performance in um, Rotterdam where someone hacked <laughs> hacked into our chat channel and um, was uh, uh, causing mischief. Um, not too bad, they pretended they were someone from Australia. I was like, I don't know, I don't know you. Um, but yeah, so we, we share our chat so everyone can kind of see the processes and um, people you can communicate because obviously um, a, a lot of people aren't physically present in the room so it's a it's a telematic band um, so people often don't know when to stop or when things have stopped or um, and there's lots of technical issues because the system's built on like really old kind of like electroacoustic music software so this is kind of an interesting collaboration because it has this sort of like um, you know, it was supposed to be like non-hierarchical and in some ways it kind of maintains that, but actually um, since sort of quite dominant people in the group have stopped chipping in so much and organizing stuff, it has kind of um, faded a little, um, which has been really interesting. I, I sort of like stepped back a little bit when we, I had a gig at Leeds and in the music department and it was the second I've been at Leeds about nine years at the time and it was the second time I've been asked to play um, and no one showed up <laughs> apart from one person in the room so I think awful maybe is a dream and but I think that the problem is is working with lots of really busy um, women and non-binary people is that actually they end up being really squashed and don't have time um, for these kinds of things. Um, after my PhD, I was really lucky to meet um, the artist Akila Bertram, who's, she's from Leeds and based in Leeds. She finished her masters at the RCA. Um, and she just started building this work called the Ultiverse. So the first round of that was in 2016. And um, it's a really fantastic, a really fantastic work. and. We met and we were interested in making it a bit more interactive. Um, so the second iteration in 2017 is what I have pictured here. And I'd helped her um, install sensors. And what was really nice about this project is that um, I was there as the technologist. So I was just doing the programming and they ha she was working with a, um, a musician to develop the sounds. So it was quite interesting it was quite good not having to deal with sound after having finished a PhD that dealt with sound. Um, and I learned a lot from working with Akila about documenting work, getting funding. She also, um, she was so good at organizing her funding and everyone involved was really well paid. Um, and so in 2018, she got an even bigger pot of money and expanded the group. So in, in those, in, when this image was taken, there was three of us working on it. So Akila is the artist and she works a lot with light um, and refraction. You can kind of see that um, quite clearly in the picture. And she builds these sort of sculptures out of this special material that diffracts sound around. Um, me kind of making programming and making it interactive and Aaron Kine as, a, uh, as a working on developing the sound. Um, but this second phase really opened up the, um, and, and so Akila's goal with this piece was just for people to feel something. Um, and then in the 2018 phase, she created this incredibly emotional piece of work. I didn't actually, and this is one thing that's important. It was such an emotional process making it. Um, but for me, I was working four days a week at the time, so I couldn't enjoy the process as much. But it was a, it's a piece, and they brought in stories of migration for people living in Leeds and were working with kind of local groups um, to, so that the, the stories were, you know, 
were built together and drawn together and then those people actually performed it and sang and I, and I will I will play you a little bit of, of this um, and it was strange like I don't normally work on very emotional projects but with this project people would we, we showed it for two days a, a gallery in Leeds and people would leave crying um, it was really amazing um, and so I'm just gonna I think I've got this up on the screen but yeah for me it was it was I missed out on a lot of the really exciting development work um, here we go what's this video so there were dancers. The people faces, the reactions, some of them like they were bursting on tears and I felt engaged and connected. It was like there is an Energy. Yeah, so that was a really um, great project to work on and um, it was just, I, I was, at the time I was really stretched and I didn't get to enjoy it and I look back now at these videos and I'm like, oh, this stuff that was going on and just these different times that we work on as artists, balancing our day jobs um, and organising ourselves and on so many different like t levels of time. Um, and it was really good to be part of like a well-funded project where, where a work was developed and iterated upon and, and brought in people's like lived experiences in, in, in really powerful ways. So that's an example of like a really artist-led collaboration. In the kind of small collaboration flex, I mean, I do a lot of like short and sweet um, one-time events with um, my friends. And so this is, this. Uh, Marlo and I had a band called Cables, and I think we practiced once and played together twice, but maybe within the space of kind of two years, it was kind of a slow burning thing. Um, and I tried to find, that there is a recording of us playing together, but actually all I could find online for this talk was um, us at uh, playing a show together in 2016, a Facebook page. Um, but I think it's something nice about the kind of ephemerality of, of collaborations and how collaborations can just be for a moment or a time they can just be about oh I've got to play a show and I don't really want to do it alone um, I've got to get my buddies down to help me um, and also some collaborations don't end and don't really start um, whereas others are like much more defined um, and I think working with your friends can be really interesting in, in this in this respect a more recent collaboration I've been involved in, um, and, and this is this is an interesting collaboration. It's with Anya Stewart Max, who's who's a video artist. Um, we've worked together quite extensively. So the video footage you just saw um, of the Ultraverse project, she recorded. She makes a lot of documentary around kind of artist projects. She's done recording of my projects, um, and so we'd always sort of worked together, but in a slightly different way. Um, we, we'd always wanted to and had hoped to build something together. We're both really interested in um, texture and movement and me from sound and her from video. Um, and so we managed to and come together and we wrote a fixed piece, which I'll show. What time have I got till, Annie? It's a while. It's about eight minutes long, so I'll show maybe the first like two thirds of that, so um, you can kind of get a sense of the project. Um, but at the time when we came to make the work together, we were we were both struggling for time a lot, so we decided to um, just have a kind of exchange of sounds and videos, and use things that we'd already made or accumulated. Um, so for me, it was like um, like bits of code or bits of sound that I just that are very familiar and easy for me, and then arranging them around some of her video, and for her it was arranging some of her video around um, more drawn out sections of sound, um, and then we went a little bit overboard and did a live show of it, 
Um, so I would be playing the segments of code and um, Anya was working with a, a visual coding language called Hydra and she was taking a loop from um, the camera feed of the main video as it played in the space and manipulating it and editing it. I, I don't have a video of, of that part, but I do have the, the kind of final video that we made together, which I'll just I'll hit play on now. Yeah, so this is like my most recent and my most, oh, don't look at that. My most recent and my most static work. Interesting um, to work on this with Anya because for me, you know, I've, I've mentioned recording sound is really stressful. Um, and so having someone to go through that process with uh, was really good. And, and for Anya, she'd never really done live work before. Um, so I was kind of 
supporting her through that bit, I guess. Um, so another, so one thing that I'll just kind of talk about quickly is I do a lot of kind of workshop based work and this is a project called Machine Learning Imaginations and it's kind of like a six hour session that I run with Helen Pritchard and Rebecca Febring that thinks about like how machine, learn how machine learning works, um, how our like uh, identity online is constructed and through machine learning and then um, Helen brings in these kind of like other kind of critical approaches and responses to machine learning. Um, so it's quite like broad reaching, um, but it's really trying to unpack machine learning, everyday lives and identity and the kind of issues and complexities around that. So we've run the, uh, the workshop a couple of times, once at Eclectic in London and then another time um, in Bradford and uh, the outcome of the workshop is that everyone makes a page for a zine, which we are then and will publish at some point. Um, and it was really interesting. The first time we did it in London, lots of kind of tech workers came and thought it would be this kind of machine learning. Um, you're going to learn about machine learning and we're going to do you some really good algorithms. And it was just a total querying of machine learning. And, and some people left midway through. It was that that good. <laughs> um, so yeah, trying to take these kind of technologies that we deal with in our everyday lives in ways that are kind of, you know, we know that machine learning is a thing and, and we talk about it sometimes, but we don't always see it happening and see, and see it um, unfolding um, unless it's in, in, you know, sometimes obviously in the press, it, it comes up in these really sort of fraught ways um, when something really bad's happened, for example, the compass algorithm with um, in the US judicial system. So yeah, trying to think about these technologies as every day, but also as powerful, but also something that we can have some like authorship over. Um, which segues into, so this is my um, research project I'm working on at Cambridge. It's called Air Kit. Um, so I have a background in electronic engineering, um, which is fortunate because it means that I can work on this project, which is just completely fantastic. So it's led by Jennifer Gabris, who was previously at Goldsmiths and then kind of came across um, to Cambridge and is concerned with sort of citizen environmental sensing practices. Um, so the, the overarching project is called Citizen Sense. Um, and you can visit the website, there's loads of resources there um, and kind of detail of the different projects. So it's not all just about technology, there's also um, a phytosensor, which is about sort of um, green infrastructure, not just digital infrastructure, because we all know digital infrastructure is part of the environmental problem. Um, so. My, my kind of role in this project, I've sort of redesigned um, some of the sensor layouts um, and I'm working on a toolkit um, for citizen sensing. So sort of writing a document with advice and guidance on how to um, monitor your local, uh, monitor kind of pollution issues in your local environment. So it's lots of participation um, and it's about thinking about technologies, not just as um, a lot of these kinds of projects are about raising awareness and they're like, oh, we're capturing data to raise awareness. But I guess here we're trying to think about ways to make this kind of data actionable and make it so it, it can make real change. And before I came on the project, not because I came on it, but before um, there have there, you know, there were. There, there are instances in Deptford where they were monitoring um, where they won and, and things weren't, um, policies and, and local planning was changed. Um, and there's an example of um, a place where they didn't win and, and they didn't manage to stop a development. And this development, well, I think it's been built, um, but Jennifer was told that apparently people aren't going to be able to open their windows at certain times of day. So it's sort of like, whilst the monitoring happened, nothing successfully came out of it. Um, the sort of residues of that action are still sort of present in different ways. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of six months into this project. Uh, we're doing our first um, 
we're doing our first monitoring study in January in um, in Deptford. So maybe see some of you around. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about a, a, a project that hasn't happened yet. And this is sustainable making for feminist action. Um, and it sort of stems from, I was really lucky to be invited by the uh, British Council um, and Somerset House Studios to play in Buenos Aires at MUTEC in April this year. And I was so excited by the opportunity that I booked 10 days in Buenos Aires and I didn't, I only knew one person and I'd just been on a US tour and I was sort of home for 10 days. I was like, I've made a huge mistake. My, my sort of, my mental health was a little bit wobbly from being on tour and traveling and I was very fraught and very tired. And I was like, oh no, I'm gonna spend 10 days just by myself crying in, an, in a cheap room in Buenos Aires. Um, and that's kind of how I anticipated it going. As you can see from the picture on the left, <laughs> like a slightly different thing happened. So I sort of communicated within my networks, like I'm going to Buenos Aires, do you know anyone? Um, and tried to meet up and engage with people. And one thing, I don't know if there's any Latin Americans in the room or anyone with Latin American friends is that they're amazing at like networking and connecting and communicating um, and having lots of fun. So I was really lucky to come across Espacio Nixo, which is this space here, which is um, a feminist hack space in Buenos Aires, where, which runs lots of sort of projects around making. And they do absolutely incredible work. They, they build toolkits for teaching technology um, to kids in this, they build these beautiful like boxes that can connect together and turn on lights. They do program, programming activities and they have no budget. Their resource, you know, they've developed their own resources out of trash. Um, they also were involved in, um, so Argentina, I think is going through quite a challenging time at the moment financially due to massive inflation and their current, the value of their currency is, is, is rapidly shrinking. Um, and also there's been a lot of, um, there's been like a kind of feminist uprising there and there's been lots of women's marches. And so Piren, who isn't actually pictured here, um, works with a group and they build these amazing LED signs for protest out of trash. And I went there and I was like almost crying. I was so tired and I just met these amazing people. Um, and f quite quickly, so this was in April and then in May, I was able to get some money for Piren um, to come and work um, on another event I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have time to talk about. Um, and from this spiraled out this idea of developing some sort of network as sustainable making for feminist action. And we found a pot of money through the Arts and Humanities Research Council that was specifically for, uh, one of the areas that it was specifically for was looking at issues of kind of gender and diversity um, quite broadly and sustainability. So we sort of got this funding bid together with lots of different people. Um, but what quickly became clear is this, this pot of money is designed for development projects and you can work with specific countries. It was designed by, David Cameron set it up to try and like essentially um, kind of digital colonization. Um, so one thing we're looking at specifically in this project is the issue of digital coloniality. And we're working with a scholar in, in Mexico who is, has a lot of experience and expertise on this issue. Um, but obviously we're the ones with the money and, and with that comes power, particularly um, in areas where it's really hard to get funding. So this has been a challenging thing to negotiate in terms of, you know, um, the different groups we're working with being really grateful, but actually we're going there to try and learn about their practices um, because what they're doing is really radical in comparison to the sort of maker communities that you see in the UK. Um, so we don't know, I'll find out next Thursday if we get the funding, um, but that would be really exciting and, and result in kind of lots of projects looking at, so the group in Argentina want to look at protest and technology. Um, the group in um, 
Columbia want to work, uh, are going to be working on projects around environmental monitoring. And um, the group in Mexico City are looking at uh, gender violence. So it's really like exciting work. Um, and it's been interesting kind of negotiating those different power balances um, and working with really lovely people. Um, so I started, I do quite a lot of um, work around kind of um, technology and inclusion and sort of started thinking about this as uh, in terms of like spaces to fail in. So how do I work a lot in like kind of hacking, I guess, and technology. So um, I've started doing lots of workshops and I guess machine learning imaginations fits in with this. Like how do we create spaces where we can work with technology with care about what we do with the technology and what we do, um, how, we, how we are with each other. Um, how do we talk about technology and expertise in relation to technology that opens it up rather than shuts it down? Uh, and what are the wider implications of the technology that we build? Um, so one of the first um, events I was involved in this was a live coding workshop. Again, there's a video of this, but I won't show it now. And part of the reason I won't show it now is because the last time I watched it, I, I didn't watch it for ages because I came across really goofy in it because I was way too overexcited. Um, so this was a live coding workshop for women and non-binary people. Um, I was really overexcited, um, but then I watched it a little while later and I looked around that room and I realized that so many of the people in that room are now my friends <laughs> and it makes me feel very emotional. Um, so like one small workshop and I met Anya, the video artist through this event. I met someone else called Anna Pika, who's a good friend, Kat Snell, who runs a night in Leeds, um, loads of amazing people. Um, and since then I've done lots of kind of workshops in different spaces. Um, I live in Leeds, which is near to Bradford and there's quite a large, um, South Asian community and I've, um, been invited to come and give workshops in coding in um, events in spaces like Women's Zone and um, uh, with projects like Women of the World, which has been really amazing. Um, we've done workshops at Pride um, in Nottingham and got to work with and meet lots of really interesting people. Um, through this work, we've sort of, so back in sort of 2014 when I first started live coding, in the UK there were only really two. Um, two women who were like performing at live coding events. Um, and this kind of work really shifted it. And it shifted it for a little while. And I wrote this quite like, I feel like maybe not quite fully optimistic, but optimistic article called Spaces to Fail In. And within a year, that kind of whole issue was crumbling um, and everyone was exhausted and fraught and lots of issues were emerging again. Um, it's never quite finished. Um, one other kind of, so another more recent, so this was in May this year, um, I organized a sort of, we called it a hackathon, but that it wasn't really a hackathon, um, but we got quite a large amount of funding to run a three day event in Leeds and um, give a really good day rate to um, 20 artists to come and um, develop work together, looking at issues of automation through a feminist lens. Um, and it was a really nice process. It was, we, we were in this really high-end shopping center in Leeds called Victoria Gate. So just down, you know, like Nespresso shops and everything's very clean and organized. And we were doing like kind of Pauline Oliveros slow walking round and security just didn't know what was going on. It was really funny. Um, the, the, the sign there originally was taped up with um, white masking tape. And I got security came and were like, you need to use clear tape. To... So we were doing this kind of... <clears throat> very experimental, like working with technology, building things together in this incredibly controlled and technologically controlled environment. Um, and we had to like work really hard to kind of disrupt that and create this kind of like welcoming queer feminist space. Um, we tried to embed lots of kind of socializing, relaxing, eating together and, and care for each other. And it was, it was quite difficult. Um, 
negotiating this posh shopping center, um, one of the women who um, participated was followed by a security guard because they thought she was um, a shoplifter, you know, these kinds of things. It was, it was really challenging, but we had a really nice time together. And there's another video of this that um, maybe I won't show now, so I have time to do a quick coding demo which is actually next. Maybe I can show this at the end. It's, we, it's, it hasn't actually been officially released yet, so you will be getting a preview. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about live coding and, and do a quick demo. So this is one of my main practice outputs. Um, it's dying down a bit at the moment because of my day jobs. Um, and um, I liked live coding because it, it it's a really nice space to like play with sound in. And I've met some really interesting people through it and I kind of fell towards live coding to avoid kind of some of the more challenging aspects of being um, a young woman composer. Um, so I'll just quickly show you my setup. Maybe you can't see, this is kind of like a quite pared down setup. So I have, uh, I normally use a Waldorf Blofeld. Is anyone familiar with them? They're, what I like about them is they're quite small, um, so you can, I can carry it in my backpack. Uh, and also um, they allow you to have 16 different sounds um, programmed on it that you can play together. So it's like multi, it's called multi-mode. Um, but you can have sort of multiple sounds. So you can have a set of percussion sounds, a set of kind of more droney textural sounds. Um, and I have this connected to my computer through USB at the moment. Normally I'll use a MIDI interface. When it's connected through USB, it goes a little bit, it crashes quite a lot. So let's see if we can make it crash. <laughs> and normally it would be through a, a, a sound, um, an audio interface or sound card, uh, but I haven't got that with me today. Um, so all I do, it's actually, I don't know if, if um, simple is the right word. I don't mind sending this setup to anyone who's interested. I'll send, um, I'll send Annie like a bunch of files, um, how I, t about how I set it up. But this is, this is just kind of like the setup file. So here you're just kind of setting up the server, setting up the sort of timing, um, and here I'm basically saying send MIDI messages to, to this USB cable, which is then connected to my synthesizer. Um, let's see if it's still working from my sound check earlier. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, you can have multiple different sounds set up on this. Um, so at the moment in channel 14, I've got a kind of hat sound. Channel zero, what are you? I'm not sure. Oh, it's called Deep Line FM. Let's see what that sounds like. Uh, it's playing quite high. Um, one, I have a different sound. Um, so if I do a quick sequence from one to uh, uh, zero to 15, um, it'll play all the different sounds. So that's going through all the different sounds. Um, let's go back to the hi-hat. Oh, actually, that's not so useful for this bit. Let's go for a nice kind of synth sound. It's quite quiet. Um, so at the moment, it's kind of playing either... So the, degree, so the channel is like what sort of sound you're sending it to. The degree is about the pitch and it's done as a scale. So if I had the scale as major um, and it was sending zero, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and I'll do that as a sequence and do that infinitely and take that bit out and put a little comma there. Isn't that nice? Oh, lovely. Um, and I can expand that out, so I might want to have, so zero, I'm not going to sing the scale to you because you can hear it. Um, and then I might go minus like seven, 
And so then we'll hear it going up in octaves. And you have the kind of low sound. Um, I can randomize this. Um, so you start to get a bit of unpredictability in it. I can, oh, I'm starting to crust up now. I'm just gonna shut up soon. I can stutter, so this will play each of those notes four times. But yeah, it's a little twee. I quite like this scale. It's quite dreamy though. Um, so duration is the length of time the note's sustained for. So if I set that to like 12, it would be held for 12 beats. And that eventually fades. Um, if I set it to like 1 over 4, it's the equivalent of setting it to 0.25. Um, amplitude doesn't come out so well on this sound, so I won't change that yet. Legato is how full the note is, so whether the note is like tss or tss. Um, I should probably just not do that and just demo the sound, but oh well. You can't hear it so well on this sound. Actually, you can hear it quite well on the cymbals. Actually, no, you can't. Um, maybe a little bit. Actually, no, that's not coming through. Anyway, so that's what it does. It's not doing it, but... Another thing you can do is the amplitude. So you can set it to generate sort of random values and add a bit of, like, uncertainty. So these are the values that are being sent to amplitude. One is like full volume and zero is off. So if I was to do a sequence where it was kind of off and then we're getting that and then randomize that. So this is basically what I sit and do. <laughs> You can also control like parameters of the synthesis. So this is just um, sending the noise. <laughs> oh, that's random. That, that was supposed to be like a slow, but I've got the random going there. So let's, let's see. So this would slowly get noisier and then drop back down to no noise in it. Um, when I finish playing and I don't know what to do anymore, I'll normally send like a random load of junk to the synthesizer and see what comes out. And this is basically my music career. <laughs> um, so I maybe I'd do a PY there between 60 and 90. So this is mostly um, the first filter on the synthesizer. And so this is sending random values. We'll do it every sort of like, you know, eighth of a second, eighth of a beat. And we get some quite quick changes. Some quite nice sounds are coming out. And then normally I just put like a four to the floor. To, oh, and oh yeah, so this is a strange thing about this synth using the using the USB. Um, yeah, if you can turn me off there. If you send uh, it just it just gets junked up and, and, and bricks it. So I can't send stuff too fast, and I think I tried to do it too fast then. But I thought maybe so if I got like 15 minutes left. Precisely. So there's a few things that I wanted to say to close with, but maybe I could, I could, so I could say those things, and then we could come and maybe leave this running, and everyone can have a go at editing it a little bit. Um, so I'll say the things that I'll say the crux of what I think I should say um, really quickly. Get through that, and we'll make some sound together. <laughs> um, and it just takes a moment for the HDMI to come through. Um, so through kind of, so I spent some time like looking through different projects I was working on when I was planning this um, talk and care, and, and I and I found these kinds of different issues that will slowly pop up on the projector. I can see them in front of me, but the first thing is is care. Um, so through kind of like you know doing lots of stuff as we do as artists and students. Um, Care is an issue that became really important to me. Care from, through, and with the people you work with, and the care that you put into what you do at a kind of small scale, you know, 
going through the frustrating process of recording for me, um, learning a new technique or approach, um, but also in, in, in the wider context of what you do, um, you know, what you do things for, where you take money from, who you work with. So it's a bit about working with people who make you feel good, but also this isn't always an option. Um, care is also finding space to rest and let ideas grow, which can be really hard in a world where we're having to act so fast and dynamically, we're scared of missing opportunities um, because we lead quite precarious lives. Um, care is about using your privilege and resources and opportunities to help others and support them along the way. Um, and one thing that I really try and do in my work now is, is tell people that I think they're really good. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important and we don't do it enough. Sustainability in the sense of sustaining our projects. So whether that's through getting money, get, having good networks of support, um, using and drilling into what you have and sharing it with people um, to help you kind of bring out as much as you can of it. Um, a really good example of this not working is awful, right? Um, <laughs> it's not a sustainable model because I think part of it is the space and the physical distance. Um, so apply for money. Um, and when you're applying, because that does make a huge difference, unfortunately. Um, Prioritising is hard. Um, and sustainability, I also think of here in terms of the sort of environmental impact of what we're doing. You know, we're living in a time, uh, a very precarious time for the environment. So we need to be, as, as artists, I think it's important for us to be thinking about the environment in what we do in, in, and in why we're doing it. Um, one thing that I put, so these are kind of things I struggle with as well, by the way. So one thing that I really struggle with, I'm very reactive and I struggle to focus on things because I'll happily like snatch away and like take on new opportunities and new responsibilities. Um, and it's really hard. Um, and I've ended up kind of going down pathways that haven't quite been the right fit, like working in, working with people that haven't been quite the right fit because I'm just reacting and responding. So I think one thing, if we're thinking with care and if we're thinking with sustainability, then we can work better at reacting and focusing in on what's really important. And this, again, ties in with the idea of balance. So, you know, ending projects that don't work. Um, you know, as, as sort of artists working with sound, we're balancing lots of different disciplines and that can be really challenging. And I know personally in, in, in my work, you know, designing hardware f to teaching, being in, working in an in interdisciplinary way is in many ways really celebrated, but actually it's really challenging and you often feel like you don't quite fit. Um, Another thing to kind of think about in terms of balancing. One thing that I have got better with over time is, is documenting and sharing my work, um, which I found really hard. I really hate putting my flag in the sand and saying this is what I've done. But it's something that's really important as artists to do. So we have kind of different references from our work and things to share and things to use um, to get better, more interesting work. Um, and it's also a way of you know, sharing your work with others um, to form new kind of collaborations and networks. So yeah, but I thought, yeah, letting, th it, what, we, what we need to try and do, or what I need to try and do, <laughs> fucking just preaching unnecessarily, is, try, is let things slip for the sake of um, those, those five issues. But yeah, so that's all I've got to say for now. Here are my details. Um, I'm on Twitter and that's my email, but maybe I'll just like let some sound roll for the next 10 minutes and if anyone wants to come up and edit the code, I can show you how it works um, and we can see how it goes. So, I'll, maybe, Or I could just leave something running and see if anyone wants to come and work on it. So if anyone wants a closer look, please come up, you're very welcome.
Hello. <laughs> so each of these kinds of clumps of code you can copy and paste. Okay. So you could maybe make a new pattern if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to call it a slightly different name. Uh, is this the name? Yeah. And where's the like channel that it's no, sending to? So that's 14 there. Ah, there we go. Okay. 13. Should we see what 13 sounds like? Yeah, unlucky number. Cool. Do I just hit enter? Or? Ah, sorry, I've actually told you the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> Is this one you want to copy? And so that's 13. Ah, okay, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, that's like musical patterns. There we go. So if you run that, you can see. How do I run it? Ah, oh, command and enter. So click anywhere in it and then... Pop, 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 pop,
<laughs> Does anyone else? Ah! <laughs> Does anyone else want to have a quick come and have a quick go and make it sound really different? Please don't be shy. Oh, you don't have to understand it. I don't think anyone really understands it. I have my eye on you. You look like you were thinking about it, but not quite fully convinced. It's alright. Um, I'd be like to take a seat. Yeah, so I did a really quick run through. Um, normally I'd spend like two hours doing a workshop on this. So if you want to like, so say, um, you can add like voice or something. So if you add this to like number four there, where the sort of regular rhythm is, so you just change it to a four. So if we look at the synthesizer, there's like a filter here, right? And then we can move the filter around. And we have these numbers coming up here. But you can change and control those numbers with code. So like you said like move this to there, but like how pardon? How do you move that, that into there? Ah oh, yeah, so it's not so what you So if you run that by pressing Command and Enter, yeah, that's it. We'll start to hear a little bit of noise come through. I think can you hear slowly. Um, but you can send that to other channels so we can see in the code if you scroll up. Happening on different channels, so sorry, that's a problem with my laptop. Um, so you could send it to one, for example. Um, so you could add a comma and a one in there. Just where it already is. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly. And it will send the same kind of control change parameters to it. All these numbers in here, yeah. these basic so these are like note, note values, and so so note values, loudness of notes, how long to hold the note for. Okay. So, I mean, you know, if I just change that to like 15, yeah, change it. Okay. So, so here, the change, you have to run it, so command and enter. Yeah, just change them. Yeah, I think it's time to stop. Yeah, have a fiddle. <laughs> okay, so let's thanks Joanne for the amazing presentation. And for making it fun and interactive as well. There um, we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, there was so Cheers. much to think about and I really appreciate your frankness and honesty and making it so personable and sharing so much about actual processes and how projects sometimes fail or dissolve and are good sometimes and are terrible sometimes yeah. and uh, politically problematic sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. That was really lovely and I think um, it connects to a lot of different things that people in this room um, do and think about all the time. Um, so let's begin with the Q&A. feels a bit sad now that the, the sound has gone. Um, who would like to start? Yeah, you can play it quietly. Who's got a question or a comment for Joanne? Yeah. Uh, how did you start to get into all this coding? 
Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. It's something I kind of missed off because I didn't want to do like a proper like, this is me as a live coder, like doing my thing. Um, but the reason I got into live coding is because one of the um, sort of, Someone who works really hard, who worked really hard to make live coding even a thing, Alex McLean, worked in the same office as me when I was doing my PhD. So he was just across the corridor. And one day he came into my office and said, hey, Joanne, do you want to have a go at doing some live coding? So obviously, yes, the background to that is I was studying computer music type things. And he, and he was like, do you want to play a gig? And I was like, uh, no. Um, and then the next time a gig was happening, he asked me again. And someone else in my lab played with me, but it was so terrible. But I kind of did stick with it um, after that, yeah. That's super cool, thank you very much. No problem. Hey. Hey. Uh, thanks very much. That was. Thanks for the sound. Was, no worries. <laughs> that was really great. Um, I really enjoyed it. And on the subject of live coding, um, I just wondered if you ever think about or talk about with other live coders the like projecting your code on the screen mm. element of it. Yeah. Um, and like, if you think it's maybe a bit like exclusive in a way for people who don't code and. Um, don't know what's going on. I mean, I know you said just a second ago that no one knows what's going on. Which yeah, is kind of I mean, half the time, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, of course. Um, but it's like uh, like a, I don't know, a bit of a tech fetishist thing, maybe? Yeah, there's definitely something with that there. And it's something that um, I've written about as well. Um, the idea of, you know, projecting the code and who's that for. Um, even people who can code really well it's exclusionary there. It also draws a lot of attention away from the performing body and, and the site of performance. And I think that's really problematic as well. Um, and it ends up drawing very certain types of crowds and certain types of people. It puts and me off going to live coding events. Yeah, no, and I mean, I think in like frank honesty that live coding has in many ways had its day. Um, they did a big show in Corsica at the start of the year. Was it an Algorave thing? Um, an, an Algorave thing. Yeah. And my friend Alex has said like, I think it's done. <laughs> um, for me, it was a resident advisor documentary that used my that. code, yeah. That used my code, my image, my collaborator Shelley's image, but played um, music of my mate Alex over the top. You know, I don't think, I don't, I think live coding, I think live coding asks lots of interesting questions about what technology is, what code is, what algorithms is, and it puts them in like slightly different spaces. But I think with, you know, white normative Western ideas about what technology is, it doesn't actually quite do what it promises. Thanks. No problem. No, thanks for an interesting question. More questions? Um, yeah, great talk. Um, going back to when you did the, the work when you had, um, you were using sensors. Mm. Were the sensors just project, were they picking up data and were you um, projecting sound from that data? Uh, which which was that specifically? I think you were talking about sensors earlier on, were you not? Mm. Maybe, yeah. Um, so this, so this is a sensor piece. Is it this one? Yeah. Or is it so? Is it all purely just vibration? Yeah, all vibration. Um, not using sort of sensor data to generate sound. Oh, okay. We did. We did actually do something together. Like we did a joke. I mean. A lot of my work's kind of a bit of it, like a, a joke <laughs> in that sense. Um, we did a performance um, called Babe Nodes um, where we had some sensors and um, some visuals and we each had kind of this Raspberry Pi thing and if people got closer to it, it would change, it would like remix our volumes um, 
And then if people put their heart rate in, it would shuffle the tempo a bit. And I think it, there was something else. Oh yeah, if people got like close enough, it would trigger um, a sample that went, babe node activated. <laughs> but I think that's as far as I'd go with kind of like audience interaction sensors. It didn't really work. Okay, cool. thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Um, the second piece you talked about, the uh, MBCR, I don't know what it's called. Yeah. Um, I guess I struggle a lot as well with um, completing work and then not having the motivation or what, just wanting to do anything with it. Mm. Does it feel like a satisfying conclusion to um, kind of have an output for the work which isn't necessarily completely sonic or true to how it was written in the first place? Or do you feel like there's still more to be done with that work? Um, yeah, so this work, I mean, it, w it did. I did have that feeling of being like, okay, I've generated lots of sounds that I don't, and like lots of bits of music that I don't really know what to do with. Um, if I bung it through the system and it will reimagine it in a slightly different way and like kind of remix it in a sort of slightly multi-sensory way. Um, and I do have like a long, you know, I can imagine this being, you could like, manufacture, I, s I mean manufacture on a very low scale there, you know, these kinds of devices and render your music through them in some way and maybe somebody on Bandcamp would buy it. Um, I did have, you know, I would like to have a go at doing something like that and selling my work as a kind of physical object, but it would require a lot of time. Um, and energy. I also, along those lines, I've always wanted to and never quite managed to find any space to even lay down the foundations for is to start, is to release something that I could then update and upgrade and as process. Um, so if anyone would be interested in that, um, let me know and like to help me make it. Because <laughs> it's something I've thought about for a really long time, being able to edit and update your work if, if it's like algorithmic generated and how that might work and what the sort of like issues are there around like, you know, whether people would want that and what control and agency people have over your work once they've downloaded it or like I guess it would be an app or something yeah cool that sounds interesting thank mm. you um with oh well with this um project did you ever think about the applications it could have with um like opening up the auditory world to people who are hard of hearing um, so yeah, um, hearing impairment is something that um, I, this work doesn't um, see, s look to that. And actually, you know, a lot of people who have hearing impairments go and enjoy musical performances and experience them. Um, and there are a lot of assumptions about, you know, what people can experience of a musical performance uh, without hearing um, all of it. And, but, so one thing um, that Kia Ung, my PhD supervisor and I did want to work on was, was, was trying to take this and work with Opera North to develop something. But unfortunately that just didn't work out because he got sick and then, um, you know, I kind of haven't really actively pursued this th this haptics project um, because I don't. There's there's not really much resources for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've I've never. I, this work doesn't specifically look at um, hearing impairments, but I mean, I know of some sort of studies where those things have been looked at. Um, a guy called Nani Yakura um, built a like vibratory chair for listening specifically for hearing impairments. Um, and there were studies all like through more about kind of sensory substitution with like Bakirita who built this kind of like grid for like drawing shapes on the body. So these have been used for like, accessibility purposes. There's also like a GPS belt um, that I don't know how, I don't know if it's gone to consumer product level, but people are working on with haptics as like accessibility mechanisms. 
or like for accessibility tech, basically. Sweet. Mm. Hey, yeah, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Um, I wanted to ask about the Awful project mm. again and um, about incorporating democracy into music. Mm. So it's, so it's something I'm really interested in. And um, attempts towards non-hierarchy or queering hierarchies mm. in general. Um, but so practically, did the, the voting set up, um, did it leave the option to each individual performer as to if they would respond to the votes or not? What, was there agency in that sense or? Yeah, so I mean, there, that wasn't specifically built into it. But one interesting thing is that a lot of people would just be playing and totally ignoring it anyway, right? So it's like, is there a point building that sort of agency in when actually people are just like in the groove of their improvisation? They're having to deal with like different times. So like the time of the sound playing together, the time of the sound they're making, the latency over the network. Um, and like a screen full of notifications that can't make a sound, otherwise it disrupts the sound. Um, so no, that wasn't built into it, but um, really it took a long time for people to process those kinds of changes anyway, because I mean, the system is fundamentally flawed and it's playful in that sense. Great, great, thank you very much. Cheers. Questions? I'll respond to that bit as well, since I was yeah. participating and I've almost forgotten about it. You um, played on that one. N not the one you showed, but no, yeah, I did play using that software mm. and it was, yeah, I wanted yeah. to bring it up as well because um, I, and the performance that I took part in, it was quite successful. So there was suggestions for us all, I think, mm. mainly to go quiet yeah. and then um, people could vote on that and when to go loud or when to get noisy. And I thought that worked quite well. Yeah. Um, at least I think I took part in one performance when we did that. Yeah, I think there was a time at the Sonic Cyber Feminisms, maybe? Mm. Did we do it then? I can't remember. I'm not sure. I think it's actually, you can hear it. It's just a slow change, I think. It, and there are some recordings that are, s that are in the slides that I'll sort of send out. Um, but I guess it, yeah. it kind of, um, helps the disembodied nature of what if you were improvising in the same room as people mm. you might feel when it's time to end or get more active or get a bit less active or do the opposite to what everyone else around you is doing mm. um, which isn't possible when you're only kind of virtually connected so mm. I found that quite fruitful and mm. I suppose I don't know how far Shelley got with that project, but it does fall into that danger of almost fetishizing democracy then, yeah. which is, um, yeah, or placing too much hopes on the the, the rights framework of yeah. voting. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think as an experiment, it was really useful and mm. quite a, provocative challenge to embodied hierarchies in music improvisation. Mm. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Mm -hmm. I no, was thanks, also just Annie. thinking yeah. about um, Michael's um, response and the danger of projecting code and fetishizing code um, and it being quite exclusionary. Um, I wonder how that was. So the people who participated and went up, um, have you already coded? Is that why you felt able to, to go up there? No, you're shaking your head. Have you already coded a bit? And who else? You, a little bit. And you? Never before. HTML 10 years ago, okay. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's quite interesting and something maybe you've come across in workshops before. Um, yeah, how do you do that as a teacher to, I guess, deal with the authority that 
code and technology often has with it, especially for people of yeah maybe older generations in particular um, or from different backgrounds. Um, and yeah, how do you negotiate trying to encourage people if it's if it's often in itself so feels so exclusionary? Yeah, I think I think the authority of code is is persuasive. I mean, I think when I'm doing these kinds of workshops, I normally um, start with something really simple and try and do something shared or collaborative um, and try and unfold and, and question code and what code is. I think it makes me think of a time when, so my mum always talks about how she's no good with technology, um, she can't do anything with technology, but to run, she runs her account, like she does invoicing of this 30 year old computer that she has to command line program to use. Um, and I think there's something, in <laughs> and she doesn't realize she's doing it. She's like, I just have to type in CD dash dot dot. Um, so I think it's trying to get to a place where we can celebrate the small and value the small things of tech that we do uh, and realize that actually, I think one, th one nice thing about teaching code in this way, using sound and visuals, is that you do get this kind of direct response. So it gives people a bit more agency over what the code is producing, differently than if you were coding a database. Or So I think having that kind of instant reaction so I'll normally start with maybe gratifying sounds, sounds that sound like, you know, more like a piece of music. Um, so people can kind of get a sense of the possibilities and using a simple, I use something called Ixilang at the start of the workshop. So people can just sort of edit. And, and the nice thing about that, it's basically you type out letters so I could write my name Joanne and each letter would have a different sample. So it may be like boom, tss, cha, cha. Um, so the code then isn't actually code anymore, it's notation. So it's like unfolding what code is. Um, and then once people have like improvised with that, played with that, um, moving on to more sort of gritty things, um, which is always the worst part of the workshop because at the start everyone's very energized. And, and I think it is like how we talk about it and talk about failing with it. You know, I'll always talk about, um, I have a lot of insecurities about being a coder and or not. And um, I used to find it really hard to like show my code to people or have people watch me code and share my code. So I, I still understand that now, you know being a relatively young woman working in technology, I still live through those issues about the authority and the pers persuasive nature of code. Does that kind of get it a little bit? Thanks, yeah, I also want to surrender my imposter coder syndrome <laughs> immediately. Um, I wanted to ask, because you know much more about the live coding scene mm. than I do, and there are different practices, so I think maybe you could speak a bit about did you do any comparisons of um, what people, because sometimes people just project code mm. and offer projected code with a conversation yeah. window. So when we performed at Goldsmiths that time, mm. I was in the room and then we had people plugged in virtually and then people on the chat room commenting mm. whilst we were playing sounds. And I think there was something about being in the room with the audience and everyone was kind of sat on the floor looking at this screen and listening to this multi-channel sound. Mm. And I can't remember what we did, but some of us started kind of making it a bit silly and funny and um, everyone was laughing reading the code, reading the chat, because yeah. they couldn't read the code. And um, yeah, so I was wondering if you could maybe comment a bit about the different practices that there are in live coding. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite like a broad, so, I mean, I obviously live code music, but there's a big contingent of people who live code visuals. So there the code um, often gets engulfed in like textures and shapes and spaces. Um, there's people who live code um, using things like pure data. So instead of using like 
lines of code. They're using kind of um, GUI and connecting different nodes together. Graphical user interfaces. Pardon? I was just explaining what GUI is. Oh, yeah, sorry. Graphical user, yeah, sorry. Though you said ethical user interfaces, and I was like, <laughs> PD? I mean, <laughs> so PD, um, yeah, is, is, is pure data is an example of that. Um, there's other people I know who, so one example that's quite interesting and a little bit different from the kind of live coding I showed you is Kate Siccio's work. Um, and Kate is a dancer and a choreographer. And so she has some different, so she uses kind of language and instructions um, for code. She's developing a new language at the moment, which is images of movement for dancers to follow. She's developed things with um, vibrators to kind of trigger movements from different parts of the body. Um, and Kate doesn't share her screen. She refuses to. Um, so you just kind of watch the performer and sort of see how these kind of algorithmic interactions unfold, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, but I think there is this rhetoric in live coding around showing the screen, um, which um, comes into question a lot. Um, and some peop and people feel very strongly in different ways about it. Um, and some live coding languages are a lot more readable. So Super Collider is not very nice because um, it has quite a lot of um, oh, oh gosh, what's going on here? Um, it has so many brackets. I mean, it's actually hard to it's hard to work in because it's got so many brackets. Whereas something like Ixilang, it kind of explains itself and uses like terminology like hush and shuffle and the patterns. So there, like you know, it's it's reduced um, to sort of a, a more like a score. And if we think about the ways in which we represent music, you know, in many ways, like traditional music notation is incredibly alienating. I remember when I was 19, and obviously I had like some training because I passed the violin hearing test. Um, and I remember someone on my course couldn't read music. And I remember just being, I was, I was, I was very, I was 19 and I was just completely like, what, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, f I kind of feel ridiculous that I even felt like that now because, to be honest, I can't really read music anymore. Um, so how we represent um, music and sound is, you know, entrenched in complex histories and knowledge and expertise. And so code, when it comes to it, isn't fully different. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyone got any other questions for Joanne? Okay. Well, I would just um, ask everyone to join me thanking you again for the wonderful lecture. Thank you so much for having me.